inspired, I'm excited, and equal parts terrified. But I think that's why conversations have to start happening. And people need to be aware of what's going on right now, and more importantly, what happens a decade down the road as these technologies keep getting better and better. Good evening and welcome. My name is Jeff Lorenz. And before we begin, I ask that everybody silences their cell phones and other noise-making devices. Um, you'll be happy to know that they took silence your pagers off of the script. It really is the future. Um, the College Division of TMEA is pleased to present session number CPE 118-207. The title of this session is Glimpse the Future, What Music Ed Looks Like in 20 Years. Presenting this session is clinician Stephen Cox, Director of Band at Fox Tech, Cast Tech, and Advanced Learning Academy right here in San Antonio, Texas. Stephen Cox is a passionate music educator who thrives off innovation. For the past decade, he was the Director of Bands in Eastland, Texas, where his bands were connected to the community, featured at the Midwest Clinic and the Texas Bandmasters Association Convention, and performed at a consistent sweepstakes quality. He was selected as the 2022 Grammy Music Educator, uh, Music Educator of the Year. Um, that's right. If you meet Mr. Cox after the clinic, you will be two degrees away from Doja Cat. Um, he is also uh, one of my best friends in the whole world, and so it is my pleasure to introduce Grammy Award-winning Music Educator Stephen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you guys for being here. Oh my goodness gracious. You realize this is happy hour and you're at a clinic. Like right now, you're in San Antonio, the river walks right there and you came here. Someone told me, they go, this is the day you find out who your real friends are. <laughs> so, so thank you so much for coming out here at this time. I, I'm so excited about this topic. Oh my goodness gracious. Because um, it's the future, like we're all going to have to deal with it whether we like it or not and it's all coming for us. So um, I wanted to take an opportunity to completely nerd out on it and how I think that the next few years are going to affect music education. Now, I said in 20 years to give myself some safety because none of you will remember what I said 20 years from now. So I can say whatever I want, which is kind of nice. Uh, but these, uh, I, I'm going to make some predictions. They say that predicting the future is a fool's errand, which qualifies me uh, to, to do it. So I, I'm going to do my very best here to walk you through this. Now, to start out, I have to let you know that in this presentation, every single image that you see has been generated with artificial intelligence using DAL E2. Okay, I'll talk to you about that if you're unfamiliar. Um, also, the clinic outline and everything was generated with an artificial intelligence chat GPT. If you would like to, you see my website's down there at the bottom. If you go there, you can go to where it says blog, as though the word blog is something people say anymore. You can go where it says blog, and you can get to a Google Drive folder. And that Google Drive folder will have um, all of the, like every time I generated, I screenshot. So you can see exactly what I typed to get everything that I got. So uh, if, if you take a look at that, and so basically, the artificial intelligence has planned this clinic, and so therefore we will be following its maniacal plans, okay? Um, again, if you want to check that out, stephentcox.com, go to blog, you'll be able to find a link right there, and you can find everything that I'm talking about and read it up close, okay? So, <clears throat> first off, the, the artificial intelligence, it said we should talk about what happened for the last 20 years. So hold on here. First of all, projectors got better. Okay, yeah, so we're going to talk about the last 20 years. Um, we're going to look at some emerging technologies. We're going to talk about some cultural trends. Uh, we're going to have a little talk about comp uh, competition. When I started talking to people about this topic, when I called up my band director friends and stuff, this kept coming up. So I'm going to kind of talk to you about what we talked about here. Um, and then uh, we, th it said, the artificial intelligence said that at the end of the clinic, we should talk about what we want for the future. Uh, and that, that scares me because I don't know if it's listening to me or, or like baiting me into a conversation. But we're going to end by kind of doing that. So. Technology was my first pick here. So I want to actually talk about technology over the last 20 years. By the way, this background was generated by artificial intelligence, right? So, you know, I didn't, I, I just said, I need a weird, quirky technology background or something along those lines, right? So let's look at what we got. The following things were not in wide usage 20 years ago or they didn't exist at all. So we're talking 2003, beginning of 2003, what was life like? Doodle -doodle 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 -doodle. That was uh, transition music, okay. 
Um, smartphones and tablets, this is a big one for me that affects every single moment of every waking hour. Did you know the iPhone was released in 2007? It's about 15, 16 years ago is all, right? And, and I don't think anything compares that I'm going to talk about as much as having a supercomputer in your pocket with access to all human knowledge has changed the way we do things. Um, I, you remember cabs? Used to be if you went to go, there were cab companies with cabbies. I mean, it wasn't a great experience, but it was a thing everybody did, you know, right? And within like two or three years, you know, an industry that had been around for decades was just gone because of cell phones, like just like that, right? Um, and, and like the intermittent technologies, who used MapQuest and printed off maps and drove around to places? Do you, on paper, like Neanderthals, <laughs> right? We had, we, uh, I, I remember that vividly, and don't miss your turn because it's over, right? The big, un, the, the big Texas maps of all the highways that you could unfold but never fold again, yeah. Uh, and, and then before you know it, we had GPSs, and then now it's all in our phones. Uh, my, my, uh, my, <laughs> my phone broke the other day, and I was stranded in San Antonio. I was probably two miles from my house, and I couldn't find it, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, another example is tablets. Tablets are interesting to me because this is an example of something we've had for 13 years that when this was coming out, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to change everything. By this point, I was teaching and I'm like, we'll never use textbooks again, right? And then I like, who has 100, like all your students have access to an iPad all the time? Anybody? Yeah, the two, one person, two people? Like the technology is there and we don't have it. So that's kind of a different story, isn't it? Okay. Um, let's see, social media. By the way, again, I, th that I, text, I t wrote in the words, music coming off of a f cell phone, right? It's, psh, and that's what that was. This is pile of social media icons. And so it just generated this image for me. It's pretty good. Um, here's all the social medias. MySpace, 2003. I had a MySpace. If you tell somebody that now, they're like, whoa, whoa. MySpace, whoa. Okay. Um, Facebook was later. Yeah, Gannon over there, he introduced me to Facebook. <laughs> He, he came into the band hall one day when I was in high school. He, he was in college. This was in, in a little town called Early. He goes, there's this new thing, and you can, you can poke people. And, and that, that was Facebook. Uh, Twitter, you know, Twitter. I forgot to put the death date of Twitter up there, sorry. Um, let's see, there's Instagram, Snapchat. You guys remember Vine? That was a thing for a minute, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then TikTok, TikTok, uh, maybe about to be banned in the US, maybe not. Tune into the local news. Um, all of these things have changed everything. Like we've not come up with how to grapple with this. If you talk to teenagers today, this is a landmine, right? Like their entire identity is wrapped up in the idea of what their social media presence is in a way that we never had to deal with. They can make a mistake in front of thousands of people. Fortunately, I lived in a small town and only had three friends, so I could only make a mistake in front of three, three people, right? <laughs> Uh, they can do it in front of thousands in a moment. Like, that's terrifying. Okay, and, and exciting. I'm sure something good has come from social media. Okay, um, streaming music and video. Again, this is an artificial intelligence generated image that is not an actual person. I said streaming music and video, digital media. It produced that image for me. iTunes. This is an interesting one. Uh, iTunes, 2003, YouTube, 2005. Netflix, there's two dates there. Anyone get DVDs from Netflix? Yeah, I did. It was the coolest thing in the world. Didn't have to go to Blockbuster. Take that, Blockbuster. Uh, poor Blockbuster. Uh, 2007 is when they started streaming. So that was the big moment of streaming video. And it was the moment that we were like, oh, thank goodness, we're finally going to get rid of cable companies. We're going to have, and, and we never realized we would have 500 streaming services. Um, but that's what happened. And then Spotify. The streaming music and video is interesting because the effective quality of these, the, the cost of these digital goods for the consumer is almost zero. Right? Like literally, if we wanted to watch a movie, you know, we wanted to rent it, that's $4 a blockbuster. You wanted to buy it, it was $20. Now it just comes to your house, you pay $7 a month, and you'll never access half of what you have access to, right? Like uh, I, I said to my students, I said, hey, in the last year, how much did you pay for music? And they didn't give me a number. They replied with a question, pay for music? Yeah, like that's, that's wildly different. That's, that's an industry that should matter to us <laughs> as music teachers that the effective digital price of all music went to zero very, very quickly. Okay, um, I want to talk about electric cars because they're cool. Now look at this image. I said, car with lightning bolt and wings. I felt like an artist when it generated this image, but I just typed those words. Um, this is interesting. There's been a lot of innovation here. I was reading an article that said this last year, for the first time in history, we had um, more demand for electric 
cars than what we had supply. Like it finally flipped over. Like there was more supply than demand for now and finally it flipped over. Electric car technology has been around for over 100 years. We had electric cars before we had gasoline cars. They just haven't been practical. So that was a really promising technology that maybe 100 years ago I would have said in 20 years we're all going to be driving electric cars, right? We're going to plug those wires in everywhere and all the cities will have electricity. And half of that was true, but some of it wasn't true. So I think this is an interesting case. Let's see, video conferencing. That's sad child on a video conference is how we generated that image. Um, Skype, FaceTime, Zoom, Google Meets. Most of us didn't pay any attention to this until like three years ago. And then it's like that's all we paid attention to for months, right? Um, yeah. Okay. So I just kind of want to talk through these. None of these things were around. And I think it'd actually be hard to imagine our lives right now without most of these. And most of them are not, not 20 years old, but 10 or 15 years old. All right? We did it. We went back in time. Here's just some other things I thought about. Mobile payments, blockchain, drones. I have a drone. I own a drone. It, it flies like a helicopter. It can take 4K video. It wasn't expensive. What? Someone go tell 11-year-old me because he would be really, really excited about this. You know, um, CRISPR, we can edit human genetics right now, right? Like, it, like some people, I could walk up to them now and say, did you know that in a living human being, we can actually edit and change their DNA and that we can do that in an embryo, that we have the technology and that it's been used? They would think it was science fiction and we've been doing it for five or six years. Um, 3D printing. Uh, voice assistants. Boy, voice assistants is one of those examples where you're like, uh. Like they, they were released and they were so bad and now they're just a little bad. You know what I mean? Like they've gotten better marginally, but uh, let's see, machine learning, big data, all these things are completely new for us as a civilization. They all have gained prominence in the last 20 years. Um, anyway, so I wanted to start there because I'm going to talk about technology in a second. I've got videos and everything. So this is what we're going to talk about. I wanna, I've got two technologies and I, I like to make videos because the videos do a much better job of staying on topic than I do. And so I've made some videos. I'm going to start with some technology things. I'm going to talk about virtual and augmented reality and I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence. But I'm not going to do it. I'm going to have a video that I may do it, uh, hopefully. So let's see here. Yeah, that's what it looks like. I always worry that the first pause screen of a video that I'll look like an idiot. And then it's like, oh, it's not just the first screen, it's all the screens. Okay, second here. All right, so um, I, I hope you enjoy this. I hope it's loud enough. And this is just a little bit about artificial intelligence and virtual reality, augmented reality. So we're going to talk about two maturing technologies that are going to affect not just music education, but society at large. The first one we're going to talk about is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, when you say that word, you're probably thinking of this. When I say artificial intelligence, what I'm talking about is large learning models that have taken and analyzed oceans of data. They take this data and they find patterns that we might not be able to see as humans because analyzing as much data as a computer would take lifetimes. It then uses this, these patterns, this data, these ideas to generate new content that's never been seen before. A couple of examples of this are OpenAI's ChatGPT as well as Dolly 2 On November 30th of 2022, ChatGPT was released and people lost their minds. This online chatbot allows you to communicate with a computer algorithm, with an artificial intelligence that will allow you to generate text, ideas, letters, emails, poems, song lyrics, computer programming code. It can do any of these things and it can carry it on like a conversation. Uh, really, the sky is the limit. It can produce any type of text that you can pretty much imagine. Uh, here's a quick example. So I'm going to say, uh, write a poem from the perspective of a oboe player in a school wind band that is being forced to do long tones and uh, doesn't want to. We're just gonna see what it comes up with. So far, it's coming up with nothing. That's the problem. There we go. There we go. Beneath the podium, I stand with reed in hand in this band. But what I'd rather you, you see is play a tune that's wild and free. Yet here I am stuck in this place with scales and long tones, no grace. I blow and blow with weary breath, my spirit crushed with nothing left. 
Why must I suffer this slow burn? It seems like a lesson I'll never learn. But then I think of music ahead and find the strength to play with my heart and my head. So I'll keep blowing these long dreary tones. For in the end, it's what I've known. For though it may not seem like much, it leads me to greater love. Hmm, is that a slant rhyme? For music is not just a game, it's a passion, a flame. And though these long tones may be a chore, they will make my playing soar. Okay. Now, the same way that ChatGPT generates text, you can also generate images through a program that's called Doll E2, also by OpenAI. And there's lots of different programs that do this. You've probably seen them all over the internet. In general, you provide a text description of the image you'd want and the style you want, and it generates options for those images. So we're gonna look at Doll E. This is a image generator from OpenAI, and we're going to ask it to generate an image for us. So let's try this. Uh, let's try piano um, with a platter of cheese on top, and let's say uh, in the style of Rembrandt. There we go, let's spell that word right. And we're gonna see what it comes up with. Okay, this is pretty good. Okay, so there's one right there. There's a piano with a platter of cheese. Option two, oh, I love this piano. It's got spirally dues, that's great. And then we got another one right here. This is neat, look, there's something coming out of the piano here. That one's getting kind of weird. Um, and there, look at that, look at that. There's one piece of cheese on the piano, the rest is down there. All right, so again, that's an image that didn't exist before that within about a minute, bam, we've got four new images. So in addition to music and, and text and images, of course, video is next. That's the next step. A imagine being able to produce an entire movie. Just to give the plot, insert the actor names you want, and artificial intelligence would be able to create you know, a, a web video or a feature length film even based on those ideas. Now, there are currently programs that generate music in the same way, that can generate background music and things like that. Uh, they're not particularly impressive. Like AI music generation is not as good as algorithm music generation like Band in a Box. But it's getting better and it's going to get a lot better as soon as people commit these same ideas, these same resources to that particular problem. Now, what does all of this mean? It, it means a lot of things. It could completely change education. We could customize everything we're doing at the student level, like live up to the promise of what education that's completely student-centered could mean. It also could do crazy things to our economy because lots of jobs may not be necessary anymore. And that's really, really scary. In the future, I want you to imagine a scenario where you go to the artificial intelligence and you say, I would like you to write a marching show for me. It needs to be six and a half minutes long. I want it written at a grade three level, except for the trumpet parts, which I'd like to be written at a grade two level. And then if you don't mind, could you also take and use these particular tempos, write it in this style, use these songs, um, and then I want to end with a really flashy moment that's at this tempo. And then can you also generate a bunch of flag designs based on this theme and write the drill for 65 people? It is entirely possible and even probable that 10 years from now, that type of AI generation for our field is going to be possible. And whoever gets there first is going to lead the market in this particular idea. The other technology that I would like to highlight is virtual reality and augmented reality. So virtual reality is being able to go into a virtual world uh, and imagine something like Ready Player One. The Oasis. This is the Oasis. It's a place where the limits of reality are your own imagination. You can do anything. Go anywhere. Like the vacation planet. Surf a 50-foot monster wave in Hawaii. You can ski down the pyramids. You can climb Mount Everest. These technologies have come really far. In fact, you can purchase 
a MetaQuest, that's what this VR headset is right here, for about $300. This allows you to play virtual reality games completely wirelessly. Uh, and the entire unit is contained there. It used to be you had to have a very high powered PC or some type of console to play, but standalone headsets that are really good currently exist. Right now in VR, you can take and learn how to play the piano. And you can learn how to conduct. You can create music with virtual instruments. And listen, these things are way better than you think. And no, they're not perfect. This technology is not Ready Player One. That's not what this is yet. But it's way better than what you would think it is if you haven't used a modern VR headset. Now, augmented reality is different. Augmented reality is taking virtual things, virtual avatars, virtual whatever, and putting those things into the real world. I want you to imagine a classroom with augmented reality. If you'd like to have a guest artist or a guest clinician, right now they have to physically come to you. But with virtual telepresence through holograms, through augmented reality, you could take and have a guest artist in your room and it'd be almost indecipherable from if that person was actually there. It would look like they were there, it would sound like they were there, and outside of being able to not physically touch them, which is probably better anyway, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know they weren't there. That could change things for a lot of people. That could grant access into places we don't currently have access. Imagine if you're teaching class and instead of having a poster or a handout or a video, a large three-dimensional model of a piano, of a symphony, of a famous composer, those things appear right in the room for you. Uh, imagine that you switch your goggles over to virtual reality and now you're in a symphony hall hearing things. This could increase access to all of these things and make it something that could happen every day in our classroom. The immersiveness of these technologies for learning, for playing, for interacting with people is shockingly good right now, but it'll be amazing just a few years into the future. The thing about technology and about these technologies that gets really interesting is when you start to combine the two things. So imagine creating or engineering using both augmented reality and uh, using artificial intelligence. It would look a lot like how Tony Stark engineers in movies like Avengers Endgame. So I'd like to run one last sim before we pack it in for the night. This time in the shape of a Mobius strip. Inverted, please. Processing. Uh, right, give me the eigenvalue of that. Particle factoring in spectral decomp. I don't take a second. These will allow us to create immersive environments. Uh, think like the holodeck from Star Trek. I've instructed the computer to give us a Sherlock Holmes type problem, but not one written specifically by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So this will be something new, something created by the computer. Exactly. Will that be sufficient, Doctor? We'll see. Program complete. You may enter. So everything that I'm describing inside of this video, of course, comes with upsides and downsides like everything else. And our society has to start grappling with the fact that these technologies are coming and they're coming soon. Uh, the last string of technologies such as social media and phones, we're still grappling with the repercussions of these things. And this stuff is on the horizon. Everything I'm talking about in this video is not based on like speculation or science fiction. These are current technologies that are maturing and evolving right now. And if we assume that we will continue to make these technologies smaller, more affordable, and improve the graphics, then everything I'm talking about in this video is literally just right around the corner. Uh, and that's unbelievable. It's exciting, it's wonderful, it's terrifying, and it is coming. Everybody okay? Everybody good? Yeah. <laughs> Silence, that's probably not good. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so, uh, how, by the way, who here has used a virtual reality headset in recent memory? Yeah, like, okay, um, pretty good, right? It, it's like surprisingly good. The, what surprised me is that there's certain experiences that it works very, very well for. One, there, there's a game called Eleven Table Tennis, and you, you take the, you know, you have a controller, although actually there's now things you don't need a controller for, like you can move your hands and see your hand in actual virtual reality without a controller and see your fingers move, which is very surreal, okay? But um, a, a paddle for 
table tennis feels a lot like a VR battle. And whenever you play table tennis, there's a very satisfying click whenever you hit the ping pong ball and a very slight vibration, which you know works really well in VR. I, I've played table tennis in VR and it feels like you're actually playing table tennis. Um, and there's like furniture in the room and you have to be careful not to try to sit on it, right? <laughs> like that's, that's the kind of experiences that you have right now. And I feel like we're kind of in like, the Super Nintendo phase of that. Super Nintendo was my console. The first console I played was the Atari. My parents had an Atari, right? But the first one that was mine was the Super Nintendo. And I remember at the time people were like, it's gonna have 256 colors. Oh, I wish I still had that copy of Nintendo Magazine. People were very excited, right? Um, <laughs> magazine, you remember those? Okay, now, uh, anyway. Uh, what I'm saying is uh, that technology seemed really impressive at the time, but what has happened to every single one of our technologies, from filmmaking to special effects to all those, the graphics get better, the units we use to do make smaller, they get more powerful. That's just kind of the natural progression. And whether or not we're going to run into limits on that, we're yet to find out, right? But um, you can expect that all these things that we have right now are going to get better. And, and honestly, I was thinking a lot about, you know, could we really get artificial intelligence to compose music well? And I got to thinking about Dolly, uh, sorry, uh, ChatGPT, which is impressive. Would you agree? How many people have played with it yet on your own? Played with it? Yeah. Some of you like as soon as are doing it right now because it, I lost like two weeks of my life to trying to test its limits, right? Um, and it's really good. And language in many ways is more complicated than music. You understand? Like the emotion of music is, is one thing, but the emotion of music is not in sheet music. It's not in arrangements. It's in the performances, right? The, the sheet music is math, and it's simple math. Like A is always going to be this frequency. There's only so many chords you can make. You understand? Language, one word can mean a million things in a million different contexts. It's not like that with music. You know, so as soon as we have someone that's really dedicating the time to putting thousands upon thousands of musical scores through AI learning algorithms, we'll have something like ChatGPT for music. Like it's, it's a matter of time. And I don't think the technology has to get any better for it to be useful. Like if we stopped right now and did the same thing we did with language to sheet music, it would be pretty impressive is, is my intuition about that and everything I've read, okay? The thing about videos is scary. Uh, and listen, I went down the rabbit hole, I'm going to admit, and this is a scary rabbit hole because YouTube can take you for days listening to the CEOs of companies and tech giants and whatever else, right? Um, but, you know, OpenAI, their CEO is literally saying, we dropped ChatGPT because we understand how big a deal artificial intelligence is going to be, and we need society to start reacting so that we don't destroy ourselves when the next generation comes out. You understand? When, when, when we can create news reports at the clip of a button, you know, all of those things, like, we've got to start grappling with that. Now, what I will say is I didn't talk to, I, like, I didn't listen to very many people who thought we were going to have a Skynet situation where the AI is going to take over, because what, what uh, these technologies are doing, the artificial intelligence things, is they're predicting what the most likely next thing to type or say would be. Okay? It's not a way of thinking like what we think. It's very, very different. Uh, there's not anyone that's claiming that something like what we're talking about is sentient or has an internal dialogue or anything like that. Um, you know, so uh, if you're worried about Skynet you know, and you want my opinion, I think that's an unlikely scenario. And we don't need Skynet to destroy ourselves. We've got all the technology to do that right now. And human brains are way more dangerous in my opinion. So anyway, just a, just a side note in case that was bothering you or don't know if that made it any better. Okay, um, so anyway, uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm about to transition into a different type of segment. But did anyone have any thoughts or concerns or questions about the technology piece? There might come a point where we have to specifically put a marker saying this song was written by a human being. I, uh, yeah, and yeah. Because I, I, at one point, want to compose music for a living, and uh, we're entering a scary place in terms of writing and making music. It's still fun. Like, don't get me wrong about that one. It just might not be very commercially viable. Well, I mean, I think that if you think of a lot of technologies and the way they're progressing, figuring out what we're going to do to make money is a, is a really big question. You know, and what I hope the answer is, is we're just going to spend a whole lot more time being humans and not being robots. Because, you know, mo most work that we do is in some sense robotic, right? I thought about this the other day. I go, if someone gave me $10 million tomorrow and I didn't have to work, what would I do? Well, I think I'd still work. I'd still teach. But I'd probably just do it four hours a day instead of eight or nine, you know what I mean? 
Yeah, like I, like I would just, I would spend more time with my family. I'd pursue my hobbies and interests more. And I'd still go work and contribute to society. And I honestly think most people are like that, right? So we, there's, there's a lot of questions. And on the terms of composition, what I think we're gonna see is, uh, think about whenever Finale and Sibelius and all those things came out, right? Composition got way easier. Like, n ever since that happened, there's never been an alto saxophone part that wasn't copy and pasted from a French horn part, or vice versa. <laughs> you know, so some, some people would say that that technology ruined composition. Well, you know what I mean? Like, there were these new tools. You know, uh, Finale has auto harmonization for jazz lines and things. You know, like, there's all these tools that exist right now to make arranging faster. We're just talking about another tool. So what does it look like in the midterm for us to be able to say, okay, generate an arrangement? And, and listen, all of the AI stuff is just a reflection of whatever we're thinking and putting into the internet, right? Everything that's trained right now. Um, obviously, everyone hates long tones, but we're like, we got to do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, this gives you a general idea of what a, a, the average human would likely say next. You know what I mean? Like, that's a lot of what this is. So if you look at artificial intelligence, it's going to be a reflection of all the music that we've created. It's going to be a re reflection of our core values, and that means at some extent it's going to be a bit generic, and that's where human beings come back in to make it unique. The maker's mark, the personality, the humanity of people is going to be more valuable, I think, as the functional pieces of technology make the mechanics easier. So and, and you know, we were talking about music earlier, right? We were talking about music, and you, no one pays for music anymore, unless you want to buy concert tickets, and then you have to sacrifice a kidney, right? Like going and seeing someone in person, that now has a much higher value. Um, in, 19, I don't remember if it was 1942, 43, it was during World War II, um, the American Federation of Musicians did like a strike where they, they were like terrified of recording technology. And so they, they for a while, like wouldn't let any AFM members record at, for any of the studios, for any of the recording studios. So like there were no recordings being made for like a whole year or so. I don't remember how long it was. Um, so, you know, I don't know that any of us would consider, like, recordings a threat to our existence as musicians, but they genuinely did. Um, so we, it seems like, I don't know if that's like me trying to make myself feel better about all this, but like, uh, like at every point there's people who were like, well, this new technology is going to steal our livelihood, it's going to steal our part of it, but you find, you know, one of the things that came from that was like uh, these, all these offer musicians were um, coming up with bebop. So it's like, you know, so you come up with this, it, it, we'll find new ways to... Well, and th think about before we had recording technology, there yeah. was only live music, yeah. which sounds really nice, except for you think about, you know, there's whole types of music and whole countries of music and whole experiences and combinations of music that never would have happened if we couldn't, you know, make a reel-to-reel -reel tape and mail it overseas, right? Like, it, there was a lot of things that came from that. And I, I think we can see those things, too. At the same time, no one needs a live musician anymore. You can have music, you can feed your soul with music without a live musician, and there are people that don't realize how much better live music is than dead music. The recorded music is dead music, can we agree? If we're going to call people in person live music, recorded music is dead music, which should make you feel better when you listen to your band's recordings, and you're like, oh, it was so much better live. Well, yeah, because you're listening to dead music now. But, but also, you've got to fix those articulations, right? Um, but <laughs> anyway, I, it's, it, it's big value. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover the rest of my clinic. That was probably enough. I'm so sorry for making everybody sad. I think everyone is sad now. I, I'm inspired, I'm excited, and equal parts terrified, but I think that's why conversations have to start happening. And people need to be aware of what's going on right now, and more importantly, what happens a decade down the road as these technologies keep getting better and better. Right? Um, so the next thing I want to talk to you about is some cultural things that have happened in music education over the last uh, 20, 20 years or so and some things we might see in the future. So I'm going to start with just two mediums that have gained a lot of popularity in the last 20 years, okay? Um, and I'm biased on these. I'm advocates for these because we're doing these at the school that I'm teaching at right now. So the first one I want to talk to you about is, is uh, mariachi music, right? Um, you didn't see this in public schools a lot 20 years ago. It's become more and more common. They have their own division at TMEA and all these things, right? Like, it's, it's gained a lot of dominance there. By the way, that's not a real child. That's an artificially intelligent generated child child playing mariachi instrument. If I didn't tell you that, you might have thought that was a real child. That's uncomfortable. Okay, um, so 
Now, now, but the good news is the mariachi program is taught by humans and some really great humans. And so this is the mariachi director at Fox Tech, uh, ALA and Cast Tech, which is where I teach. I do not teach mariachi, and so I just went into their room and listened a bunch. And uh, he's going to kind of share this. How many people have actively worked in or with the mariachi program? Okay, so actually not very many of us all in all, right? So this is kind of an intro to what mariachi is like. Uh, my name is David Samaripa. I'm the, one of the mariachi directors here at Fox Take ALA and Cast. We have about 325 mariachi students combined. Believe it or not, 90. 5% of our students don't speak Spanish. They don't speak Spanish. And if you think about it, if you go to college and you take choral, you sing German, you sing Italian. Do you understand it? In mariachi, it's not considered a mariachi unless you have two instruments, which is this instrument, the vihuela, and a guitarron, which is a bass. Um, the vihuela has a small hump. It's a five string instrument. So from the bottom, the first string is gonna be an E, a B, G, octave, D, octave, and then you have an A, octave as well. The B and the E are, are the same as the guitar, but everything has an octave. So I'm going to play a traditional rhythm called the Son Caliciense. Uh, for UIL, that's what we use in, in competition, which is a... Uh, Mariachi is a traditional uh, music, Hispanic Latin music, but you have, you have music from Spain, you have music from France, you have music from, from all over the world. And, and Mexico in itself is a melting pot. You can't say it's just Mexico. The Spanish guitar, we don't pluck it uh, unless we have a recording or some competitions, but we strum it. The first instrumentation for mariachi was actually a guitar regolpe, which is a five-string guitar uh, slash vihuela, the violin, and a harp. The trumpet came into mariachi in the late 1920s, 1940s, if I'm not mistaken. It was the last instrument. The other instrument that makes uh, mariachi is called the guitarron, which is a bass. Um, it's not heavy. Um, we, it looks heavy. It's, it's, it's hollow. Uh, so this, the name of the strings are the bottom, are A, E, C, G, D, and then octave A. So you're always going to be pulling octaves. So if you play an A, you're going to play A, high, and low A. So it's an A right there. So it gives you a nice range, A. If you play a D, you're going to press the C, and you're going to have a high D with a low D. E, same thing, F sharp and so forth. So C, B, B flat, A, A flat, and so forth. So again, I'll play a little bit of Son Calicense for, for uh, as an example. So it's That's a guitar run. Uh, we have a lot of the students that are mariachi because their friends are a mariachi, but most of them, it's because their grandparents know mariachi, or they've sang a little bit of the of the mariachi music. And it's funny because I'll see um, I'll see some 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 Anglo child. Hey, so so what got you into mariachi? And they're like, Oh, my grandfather is from Mexico, and he wanted he wanted to sing this, and oh, my my grandfather loved to sing this. He passed away. There's a lot of connection between family. There really is in mariachi. We, take, we think about mariachi as just a Mexican so group or Mexican song or music group. Uh, mariachi is, it's, is music, music. All right, yeah. 
Um, so, I, and by the way, I, I don't think David made it here, but I, I really appreciate him letting me come in and film and talk to him and, and kind of share what he does. Every time I go in his classroom, I've, I've been a band director for a long time, I'm like, oh, this is the same thing. Like, this is literally the same thing, look at that. They, they're all doing the same things. It's kind of like a mix of band, orchestra, and choir all together, right? Um, and this is a beautiful medium for teaching kids. Like, it's, it's fantastic. Um, you know, it, it's, we don't do this everywhere, right? We probably could. Uh, it would make just as much sense to do this everywhere as it does to do marching band. You know what I mean? Like, who came up with that, you know? Uh, so, like, the, these things, there, there's, a few other, there's a few other things like this. You know, I think of steel drums. Steel drum bands and stuff have been really big and, and have been growing in popularity. And so me as a music educator, my belief is I want all the kids to study music. I want everyone to see a place where they could be studying music. And most importantly, I want them to see themselves as musicians and keep doing it after they leave. Um, and I, I think Mariachi actually has a really good track record for that. Um, and it's super, super cool. Um, and, you know, whenever I, I, I always worry that whenever I talk about this stuff that everybody's uh, program protectionism uh, response will kick in. I have one of those too, where it's like, oh, but if we offered this at my school, then some of my kids wouldn't do my thing and then I wouldn't have a thing anymore. And I understand all of those concerns and ecosystems and things. And I'm, I don't think things like mariachi and what I'm going to talk about are replacements for traditional music education mediums. That's, that's never what I think it is. It's just more things we could be doing. You know, you understand? And then I think there's places where certain mediums even make extra sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like even more than in some other ways. Um, and that has to do with community partnerships and what's going on. I'm going to give you another example of something that's gained a lot of popularity over the last 20 years. And this is something I'm doing this year. So I hate the term modern band because it, it makes it sound like traditional band is old. And I mean, it is, but that's not what I mean. But, but we've got cool music now. Come on, kids, be in the band, right? Um, but uh, this is kind of the term that's evolved for what a lot of times is called rock band, but it's not just rock music, so that's a, not a great term either. So anyway, I, wanted, I made a video about the modern band program that we started uh, at Fox Tech this last fall and kind of show you what we're doing um, and talk about how these two things are similar and different and how we might see more things like this in the future. Modern band is the name that has been given to the music education medium of teaching children popular music through drums, guitar, bass, keyboard, and computers. And this idea is that you train the students on the fundamentals of those instruments, just like on any other instrument, with the goal of them being they form their own rock and pop groups, write their own music, do covers of popular songs, lead their own rehearsals, and develop the habits that will lead them towards lifelong musicianship. And we do all of this through the idea of the music that children care about and are listening to before they walk into your classroom. The idea of teaching music through popular music or rock music is not new. In fact, it's been around in popular culture for a long time. It has come to my attention that you are teaching the students rock and roll. Is this a problem? Is this a problem? Yes, I think so. I think it's time we started our new class project. A science project? No, it's called Rock Band. Is this a school project? Yes, and it's a requirement. And it may sound easy, but nothing could be harder. It will test your head and your mind and your brain. The connection between studying music and using the music that students care about before they come into your classroom is really powerful. It leads to very highly motivated, very excited student musicians. Leading the charge is a group called Music Will who have developed a method book for students. These method books are amazing. You take and you teach the students a few chords and within the first week or two of instruction they're playing popular music from the last five years on these instruments. As these books progress, the students read more and more music. They learn more and more comping patterns. They learn scales for improvisation. They learn to write their own lyrics and write their own chord progressions. The depth of what they learn through this medium is very, very deep. And it also encourages that over time students become multi-instrumentalists, perhaps learning to play all four of these instruments instead of just one or two. Some of the students that I'm currently teaching didn't even know what elective they were signed up for, and now they've found something that they love. This is a tool that can enter the music education toolkit and really give us an opportunity to reach students that we aren't currently reaching. If our goal is music education for all, if our goal is lifelong musicianship, then this is a model for teaching music that we really should be considering at all levels. 
Right, so I'm teaching this modern band curriculum alongside a traditional band curriculum, so students can go in either direction, okay? Um, I lost a few kids from, that were signed up for concert band into this. I, I did. You know, in general, they were people that concert band wasn't working for, right? The ones who really like concert band are still playing their concert band instruments. But I've had a lot of kids, like th this is what my situation was. I, I went and I spoke to the district. Hey, good to see you guys. Yeah. Um, and we had a meeting and the, our, our school situation at Fox Tech, ALA and Cast Tech, since I say three school names, you know it's weird. It's kind of weird. And we wanted a model that would really work here and reach a lot of kids. And so I suggested this and we talked about it and they said yes. They said go for it, you know, and, which is great. Thank you. That's good administration. Um, Okay, so we, uh, we, we launched this and I talked to a couple of people, let the counselors know, and within a week, without really advertising it, 70 additional students were taking this class that were not taking an elective that they particularly cared about. Um, and within a semester of this, five performing ensembles evolved that are completely student-led. They've picked their own music. The music is as diverse as the students. Some of them are playing Beach Boys, other kids are playing like grunge metal and doing this kind of screaming singing that I wasn't really used to, but have developed a respect and palate for. Um, and, but it, it's completely them. And I, I don't know, a, a lot of people that I know that continue to play music, these are the mediums. This and jazz are the mediums that they tend to do outside of academia, right? And so this offers some opportunities. Um, and I could talk to you about this for like an hour and a half, but we're towards you know, the latter half of the clinic, so I won't. Um, but I think that this is a really neat medium. And I think the reason we don't do this in more places is discomfort and, and fear that it's going to kind of mess up what we're already doing. And we've got this, you know, kind of survivorship bias where if we're teaching these things, it's probably because we were the people and kids that loved them and did them. But there's a lot of kids that don't see themselves in music classes. And so I want, I, I still want to teach all those kids. Um, and not everybody feels that way, but I think a lot of people do. And this is one potential way to do that. Okay. Um, I got one more thing for us to talk about, and I'm just going to step on this. Oh, wait, before I do that. I just started typing things like, could you teach music through a, a, an ensemble that primarily trains in gospel style music? Sure. What about all these other countries and their music and their instruments that I can't pronounce and don't know, right? You know, I, I actually, I'm a professional music educator and I can't name very many instruments from other countries. You know, like, like we're going through the mariachi instruments and I'm like, oh, I actually didn't know what any of those were called. And there's kids at my school playing them, right? Um, I felt very inadequate because nothing in my training taught me anything other than European Western music, you know? Um, and whenever I studied pop music, it was on my own. You see what I'm saying? Could you have a music education medium that is centered around playing bluegrass music? Now, obviously, I'm not advocating for this. Who would? But could you do it? Yes. <laughs> no. My, my, dad, my dad is an amateur bluegrass musician, right? You know, and he's done this his whole life and he loves it and it means everything to him. And I'm sure there are kids that have passion like my dad. Um, and if this reached them, I would do it. I mean, I'd hate to do it. I'd hate to go order a banjo, but I would do it. And anyway, um, I, I wish I'd learned to play clarinet in the Klezmer band. Wouldn't that have been amazing? Yeah, okay, All right. I'm just saying. All right, um, obviously music technology is a big thing, um, you know, music technology classes aren't in most of our schools, right? And we just talked about how much music technology is about to change everything. Um, and my sense is that that's probably an oversight on our part. Um, and, you know, yeah, that's, that's all I have to say about that. Um, I, I literally have nothing else to say about music technology. We didn't have technology. All right, let me get to this other thing. Okay, this is something that I've been grappling with for at least the last 10 years, right? Is what is the role of competition and what does it mean? Now, by the way, this art of AI generated image, I said, marching band student passed out under a pile of trophies. And when my wife saw this, my wife is a visual arts teacher and she is very good. And she said, okay, this one is art, right? Like, like up until this point, she's like, that looks pretty cool. But she goes, this is art. This has a message, this, this has something, right? Um, listen, I, this is a really complicated topic, and I don't know how I feel about it. What I do know is that the burnout clinics at TMEA have been very popular. And as I started talking about the future of music education, lots of people talked about what we're doing and how much we're doing. And the question is, if you tell me that competition is certifiably the best possible way to make kids better at their instrument, well then I'll go do it all. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
But I have heard lots of compelling arguments that that's not the best way to get good at your instrument. And I still practice my instrument and I'm not competing with anybody. Like not a single person. Uh, and once you get out of schools, when do you go to music competitions if you keep on making music? Ever? Like, I don't know anyone who's like, ah, oh, you know, yeah, I'm just, I've got to go to this music competition this weekend, unless they're a music teacher and they're taking their students to it. You know, I, I, I don't know that everything we do is reflective of lifelong musicianship. And just the number of people that said, we're at a competition bubble. We're, we're pushing things so far and it's becoming so much that this bubble is going to burst. And I had other people that said, nothing is going to change. It looked exactly the same 20 years ago. It'll look exactly the same in 20 years. Um, and I don't know. I know that for me personally, I've started to really doubt the value of a lot of competitions. I've started, you know, I, I value rigor, right, you know, to the extent that I want my kids to put out good work. I want them to try hard. I want them to put forth effort. But whether or not they can do that from a completely, better than a completely different school somewhere else with completely different student population and different resources says a lot more about their circumstances oftentimes than it does about the kids. And so this is, this is something I, I, I feel like the competition in music education bubble is going to burst and that we're going to have to focus on community and passion and performance. Ooh, get those kids out and perform everywhere. You know how many, you know how many music programs only perform in empty auditoriums for three people? It, like, that's probably bad. I don't know. My belief has always been the more that you go out in the community and perform, the, the more people care about music education. Um, and it, it may be a nice write-up in the paper to take home a trophy and things, but I don't think it garners real support, like showing up at the nursing home with a bunch of kids and making a bunch of people's week, you know? So anyway, that's my opinion. That's, that's an opinion and prediction. I crossed the, I, I feel like I crossed over the, you know, the observer looking at this that I tried to be with the technology. And on these, I, I'm kind of leaning into advocacy, but I see a lot of trends here. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Yeah. Look at that. that, that was me and Robert Frost and Dolly too. We all worked together on that. Without my typing skills, that would not exist. Okay, so, you know, there's a lot of questions about how we're gonna deal with everything. Um, like, you know, uh, is technology gonna ruin everything? Is it gonna make everything better? Uh, and the whole thing is, technology isn't going to do a single thing. Like you unplug the computer, it sits there, it doesn't do a single thing. People do it all, every single bit of it. And if we let technology run away, that's because we as a society, as music educators, as whatever, let it do it. So we actually get to decide what this is. And I think for too long, at least I feel over the last two decades, by and large, we just kind of let the tech billionaires figure out their stuff and we just deal with the consequences. And probably we should think about this stuff, decide what we want and start advocating for it. And that's the, what the artificial intelligence told me I should say. <laughs> Well, I, you need to do closing. Oh, Are you sorry. going to do closing remarks? Uh, Any closing remarks for me? Thank you guys again for, for being here at this time. I can't believe this. Look how I didn't even know TMEA was open this late. I, this is my first 630 clinic to attend, not, not to, yeah. But I mean, I'm always at dinner by now. So thank you guys so much. Um, and and uh, is there anything official in you now? All right. Anyway, you guys have a wonderful TMEA.